Um, we're going to answer some questions that come in from our webcast viewers so that if this is a question that's been bothering you, I have an answer. Or if it's a question where you thought, I wonder what, if that's right or wrong, we have an answer for you. How are excess deductions upon termination of a trust or estate handled? We have proposed regulations, and if you've taken our federal tax update class or our federal California tax update class in the estate and trust chapter, there is more information on reporting excess deductions. But in those proposed regulations, the IRS clarified, mm, expanded what they had told us before and told us that when the estate or trust closes down, if there are leftover deductions, deductions that the trust or estate were unable to use, those deductions are passed out to the beneficiary. So it's an excess deduction, and let's say the excess deduction is in category one. It's a deduction that would have been allowed in arriving at the trust or estate's income, um, except there wasn't any income. Those class one deductions, let's call them, are estate administration costs, trustee fees, legal fees, accounting fees, fees that are directly for that trust or the estate. It's the income tax return of the estate. There's another category of deductions that could be passed out, non-miscellaneous itemized deductions, and those might be state and local taxes or mortgage interest paid. And finally, there could be a category passed out. So in other words, what's being sent out on the K-1 for these final expenses at termination would be category one, deductions that would have been permitted by the estate, category two, non-miscellaneous itemized deductions, state tax, property tax perhaps, um, or mortgage interest, and category three are miscellaneous itemized deductions. Now miscellaneous itemized deductions subject to 2% are not allowable on the individual's tax return and therefore when they're passed out, they will pass out as that category and then not be deductible on the individual beneficiary's tax return. So that's a long answer to a hard question. What, what happens to these excess deductions? Finally, the IRS did clarify that for us in their proposed regs. What meals are 100% deductible? Well, we are talking particularly about the year-end law, which we are referring to as CAA 2021 Consolidated Appropriations Act, signed by the President December 27th. So that law, as Congress wanted to help the struggling restaurant business, that law says for 2021 and 2022, business meals and beverages provided by restaurants. That's the quotes. Business meals and beverages provided by restaurants are 100% deductible. Now, you still must follow all of the, the rules, the law on what is a business meal, that you have a client with you, that you had a discussion before, during, or after the meal. It is in the middle of your day's meeting or at the end of your day's meeting. So you still follow all of the um, meals rules. You know what almost came out of my mind? Meals and entertainment rules. No, no. Entertainment's different than meals, Sharon. That was a moment ago of a change in the law. Right, so the question that's come up is, because we don't have any more guidance from the IRS on this at this point, but I got a, I got a personal question that came in from a, one of my accountant friends that said, do you think that if I have the meal delivered to the office, that that's still a restaurant meal? Or I have the meals delivered to my house for a casual business meeting with my client, that that's still a restaurant meal? Well, there's nothing that defines business meals and beverages provided by the restaurant. But I don't think there's anything in there. Now, this may be my wishful thinking, so careful. I don't think there's anything that says I have to be sitting at a table at the restaurant, especially considering all of the 
shutdown orders we've had, no indoor, maybe no patio, you have to take everything delivery. So it seems to me if we were writing this ourselves, it would mean that any meal provided, whether it was in the restaurant, on their patio, or a pickup or delivery, would qualify for the 100% deduction. So this is 2021 and 22 only. For 2020, the rules are the same, 50% deduction for uh, meals. And then our another question that came in for Airbnb income. I think Airbnb, Airbnb income is more common, uh, especially in the dense urban areas. But is that income reported on a Schedule E? That's the question from our webcast viewer. The Schedule E is used to report rental real estate income, right, and royalties and a few other things, but it's about rental real estate income. You use the Schedule E for Airbnb income if your client did not provide substantial services to the guests, such as cooking and cleaning. So if meals or daily maid service um, are provided to your guest, then that sounds like it would go on a Schedule C. So I had a client build an Airbnb with five bedrooms that were rented out in a, in a very big tourist area, beach area. And that, is, that was clearly a Schedule C business. They had lots of guests. They provided lots of services to their guests. They are operating like a hotel. But for your client that has a bedroom available on occasion and does nothing more than provide that bedroom um, to their guest, then that would be Schedule E rental income. So there we are, a few questions from our webcast viewers. Um, I hope tax season is good for you and that you are now used to wearing your mask. So thank you for being here. I'm Sharon Kreider at Western CPE.